All right. Um, so we're recording this lecture as well. Um, this lecture picks up on the introductory lesson that we talked about. And you may remember that we discussed how that's going to serve as a foundation. And we also talked about the paradox of psychology. And today we're going to spend a little time uh, pre-scientific psychology. We're going to talk about a whole bunch of philosophers. Um, I'm not sure we're going to get through all of it today. In fact, I doubt we will. We'll probably get through about half of it. Um, but that being said, um, we're, we're going to plow through it. Now, um, I do have a question. Did you receive my email? of the first lecture videos in a syllabus review? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So yes. I don't have to necessarily do that because it's a synchronous lecture, but I figured since we're doing Zoom, it's nice to record it and just give it as an additional resource. So um, I hope you'll use it. Uh, please, please, please. Uh, if there are any questions or something you heard on the video that sounds different than when you were taking notes in class, certainly bring it back in. So um, before I go into today's lesson, though, does anyone have any questions from the previous? You think I can do it, yes or no? You think I can do it? Any questions? All right. So let, then let's get started. I'm going to do a, a very quick um, speed through uh, early, early, early philosophy. And then when we get to the Renaissance, I'm going to spend a little bit more time. But when I took the history of psychology, we had to go all the way to pre civilization and try and understand the origins of psychology through that. And uh, believe it or not, it was only in maybe the ninth week of the semester that we actually started talking about people like Rene Descartes and whatnot. So I'm trying to squeeze it all into one lesson, but please note that uh, there's a lot more to say about all of these concepts. And this is just kind of a primer as to what philosophy looked like at that time. All right, so um, we're, we're talking about pre-civilization. There are two concepts that I think are important for you to understand, the concept of animism and anthropomorphism. Animism is the sense that nature is alive and anthropomorphism is given human-like qualities to nature or non-humans. So uh, a good example of animism might be that um, a tree is alive, right? And um, we recognize, but not just in a, in a plant-like sense, but in a, um, like an animal-like sense that plants are alive. So that would be animism. Anthropomorphism would be more of um, saying your dog loves you. Now, um, it very well could be true that your dog loves you, but how do you know, right? Has your dog ever spoken those words? The answer is no, right? Your dog cannot speak because of the, uh, the lack of vocal cords, the way we have them. And therefore we can't 100% know that our, our pets love us, but what do we do? We infer that our pets love us through their actions. So if uh, our dog jumps on the bed and lays next to us, we infer that the dog wants to be near us, is attached to us, uh, might even love us when the dog rolls over for pets, uh, wants to be rubbed on 
uh, its belly, we say, oh, well, see, this is a sign my dog loves me. But maybe from a, a purely pleasure point of view, the dog enjoys a, a free massage. Maybe it has nothing to do with the emotion that we call love. And uh, it's very hard to infer uh, love in animals. Um, and when we do, we engage in anthropomorphism because we can't possibly uh, fully know for sure. Uh, and again, as I said, maybe they love us, maybe they don't. I don't know 100%, but we do have a tendency to anthropomorphize. Um, let's see. Yeah, so through affection and gratification, right? So we get, we get a feeling of gratification and bonding to our pets. And we know what love is, right? But it's kind of a theory of mind issue. Can we really know what's in another organism's mind? We can't, right? So um, I appreciate what you're saying, Rosa Maria, but that's our projected feelings onto the pet. And um, that's, that's why it's anthropomorphism. Now, moving to early Greek religions, you probably are familiar with the Olympian gods, right? Uh, so the Greek gods, can anyone name one of uh, the Greek gods? Zeus. Zeus, right? Sorry. No, that's, don't, uh, don't, don't be sorry. Okay, so Zeus is kind of like the overarching god, uh, the most powerful. Africa. I'm sorry. And then there's a whole bunch of them coming through. Yeah, so now we sometimes mix Greek and Roman gods together. Uh, because they're just called different things and they're actually the same concept. But so people like Aphrodite, right? Um, Aphrodite and Venus are uh, parallels. But either way, uh, the way people understood the world was through these different gods that control different aspects of, of the universe. And um, now, Mo Hades, yeah, for sure. Uh, now we have shifted away from an Olympic God model and uh, moved towards, at least in this country, more of a monotheism, but there are uh, faiths that still maintain um, multiple gods, right? So, but you can see even early traditions that there are multiple gods controlling different things. Now, the Dionysic Orphic religion talked about reward and punishment and the assumption that we did something wrong, we committed uh, a sin, and now we have to purify the soul, and we go through a series of reincarnations until the soul is purified. Now, that might seem like, why am I talking about the soul? Uh, when we get to the understanding of the soul and the mind, in the Renaissance period, you'll see why I'm bringing it up. So, but the concept of the original sin, the concept of reincarnation and rectifying the soul, which is very common in the Abrahamic faiths, you can also see in a Dionysic Orphic religion. So now where, where does this kind of philosophy begin? Well, we, we start to try and understand the universe, and you will see that there were the uh, cosmologists who are like, well, what is the origin of the universe? And philosophy moved us towards more natural explanations versus supernatural. So if you ever are like, well, what, what do we mean by mythology? Mythology you know, in a sense that we're describing is about the supernatural explanation, whereas philosophy is trying to find uh, a natural explanation. So the first 
attempt was on physis, which was to try and find the primary element that everything was made of. So again, looking in nature to see, well, this is um, what's going on here. So for Thales, water was the primary element and that, that does seem logical for many people because without water, there is no life, right? And even if we explore other planets, we get excited when we hear that there might be water on that planet because that creates the potential for a discussion of life outside of Earth. Um, so people get excited when they hear waters on other planets. So Thales understood the concept that water uh, was a primary element. Now, Anaximander argued that there's an infinite number of elements. That's not true, of course, right? You know, what we've done the periodic table of elements. So we know all of the um, elements of the universe. So, uh, but Anaximander also starts with our first explanation of evolution. And you may recall in the last discussion, uh, we mentioned Charles Darwin. And Charles Darwin is considered uh, the founding father of uh, the theory of evolution. But he's not the originator. And, and I tried to make that um, point, you know, hammer it home. Because even if we go into Greek philosophy, Anaximander, uh, he actually came up with the first documented theory of evolution. And it, it's, it's very, very overly simplistic. Water and earth matter rubbed together, and that is what created fish. And then fish, you know, everything uh, comes from there. Fish create other creatures and then ultimately creates human beings. But evolution was based on um, the mixture of water and earth matter. That's an Aximander's idea. So Heraclitus focused on fire. You know, fire is um, quite a, a paradox of an element in its own right, because fire can be constructive and fire can be destructive. So whereas Thales focused on water, uh, Her Heraclitus focused on fire and examples of um, fire being constructive. Well, in the early days, we used to warm ourselves by the fire. Uh, we cook our food via fire. Things of that nature is constructive. But fire can burn, destroy, and consume as well. So the fact that it had this duality uh, Her Heraclitus thought maybe that was the primary element that everything else came from. Um, Appendicles talked about the four elements of water, fire, air, and earth. This sense of the four elements is in a lot of Far Eastern traditions as well. Uh, but uh, this is another source that says, hey, maybe it wasn't just water. Maybe it wasn't just fire. It was a combination of these, the fusion of these four elements, right? So that's the origin of the universe as it is explained. Now, a sophist, a sophist rejected the, the concept of absolute truth. So there were subjective realities or relative truths. And uh, Protagoras said that truth is dependent on the perceiver. Now, I, I adopt this model in therapy, especially when I'm working with families and couples. There, there it is very rare that one person's version is 100% true, but their experience is nonetheless very true. So the perceiving person is, it's their truth. Now, Georgius suggests that there is nothing really exists and there is no objective truth whatsoever. Now, the sophist collectively would say that, you know, more important than trying to understand an objective truth is trying to understand the moral, trying to understand the lesson 
or the message that's being conveyed, that's more important than some objective truth. Now, uh, you've probably heard of uh, Plato. Uh, Plato is one of the, you know, more famous Greek philosophers, uh, Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates. These are the, the big three, so to speak. Uh, now, Plato talked about this concept of forms, and he suggested that there is a perfect understanding, but that only occurs in the abstract. But when we apply these perfect concepts to the real world, they become imperfect applications. So uh, when we, when we, let's say we were to talk about an equilateral triangle, conceptually, I understand what an equilateral triangle is, right? Three sides with equal angles on all three sides, right? Uh, that makes sense mentally and in, in the abstract. But if you don't give me a ruler or some kind of graphics and you ask me to draw an equilateral triangle, I'm probably not going to draw it perfectly. And that's kind of the sense of what Plato was talking about is that we make inferior copies of things that are objectively true. So we somehow... Uh, interfere with the abstract perfection. Now, uh, Plato also talked about different levels of the soul. Uh, and this concept is also rooted in um, different uh, traditions, especially the Abrahamic faiths, that there are different levels of the soul, such as the rational soul, the rational soul is kind of the eternal soul, the immortal soul. And then we have the more courageous soul, which is more of the emotion or spirit, so to speak. And then we have the more uh, appetitive soul, which is basic desires. So the physical, the emotional, and the, you know, immortal, right? Uh, so these are the three levels of the soul. Now, you might apply that to the Trinity in Christianity or um, the discussion in Islamic uh, traditions about nafs versus other levels of the soul. Or in, the, um, in Jewish traditions, we talk about um, the neshama, the ruach, and the nefesh, which have different meanings, different aspects of a soul. So what Plato was talking about, many other faiths have adopted. And the assumption it was that these aspects of the soul were in conflict, right? So uh, if you had the immortal, rational, or moral aspect of the soul, it's going to be more um, in a tug of war with the base desires. And, you know, this concept, I think it's, it's not too early to apply Plato's idea to someone like Sigmund Freud, right? Remember Freud's id, ego, and superego? Well, the id would be the appetitive soul. The uh, ego would be the more uh, courageous soul. And then uh, the superego would be the rational soul, right? So it, these can map on very nicely to uh, philosophy and psychology as a whole. Now, what's important uh, for at the bottom is that Plato also believed that knowledge was innate. What does that mean? We are born with knowledge. We are born with a, an understanding of the world. And, you know, that can only occur if there's part of the soul that is eternal. So, and it can only occur if that soul is put into a new body. So the concept of an immortal soul and reincarnation are very much part of Plato's ideas. So uh, when the soul is put in a new body, 
it maintains all the past knowledge from previous life forms. Uh, that's Plato. Now, Plato, it, not everyone agrees with Plato. Aristotle, Aristotle uh, says everything in nature has a purpose and his purpose is built into uh, a person. Now, this concept of everything in nature having a purpose can be applied to people like Abraham Maslow and many of the humanistic existential psychologists who talk about teleology, which is that everyone's life has a grand purpose, right? Now, in terms of the soul, uh, Aristotle has his own sense of a soul. He talks about a vegetative soul, which is not unique to human beings, but uh, plants have this level of life force of, of a vegetative soul. Then you have a sensitive soul, which is the level of non-human animals. They have the ability to uh, experience pleasure, pain. They have memory. Uh, and then when we deal with uh, human beings, we operate based on a rational soul. Um, and that's interesting because, again, here we're talking about Aristotle, who's a philosopher. But when you look into religious traditions, you see a lot of this as well, that the, in, in um, God's creation, there are different levels of life force. And you, you can map it onto Aristotle. Now, um, what I will say is that Aristotle disagreed with the concept of the soul being immortal and disagreed with the concept of reincarnation. And he felt that we are born tabula rasa. We are born a blank slate. And our understanding of the world comes through experience. Now, I intentionally described it very much like another philosopher. Does anyone know who in the Renaissance uses that very language of tabula rasa? And you're going to hear about this person uh, as we move forward. The answer is John Locke. John Locke uh, argued with Rene Descartes in, in philosophy as to the nature of the soul, the nature of the mind. But Rene Descartes, you could say he was in more in line with Plato and Socrates, and John Locke was more in line with Aristotle. And I, I bring this up because there are cycles in history and there are ideas that emerge as a function of these cycles. So Aristotle's idea is passed on forward to people like John Locke. Now, a law of association, how do we understand uh, things like memory and linking things together? Now, this is a cool thing because the law of association is connected to modern cognitive psychology. And I, I'm going into philosophy because I want you to see how, how connected philosophy was uh, in you know, setting the stage for the science of psychology. So if you were to think about learning and memory, the concept of law of association is applied, but it really comes from people like Aristotle. And Aristotle says, how do we connect things together? Well, one way that we connect things together is something called con, uh, contiguity. Now, contiguity is things that are happen uh, close together, whether it be in time or experience, are more likely to be connected together. Now, uh, if you're like, well, I've never heard that word contiguity, you might have actually heard the word contiguity in a different form, the word contiguous. Contiguous, you might say, if you were in a contest and you won a contest, you could get a free flight to anywhere in the contiguous United States. You might hear that. 
Well, the contiguous United States are the 48 states that are one right next to another. That flight would exclude uh, Alaska. That flight would exclude Puerto Rico, Hawaii, anywhere that's not from the East Coast to the West Coast continuously. So that's what contiguity is, closely next to one another in time or space. Now we also learn to associate things uh, that are similar in concept. So if I were to ask you to think of like a heuristic and put things into a box um, I, and ask you for a synonym, and I'm gonna throw out a word, the word happy, can anyone think of a similar word or concept to being happy? Joyful. Joyful, right? Elated, excited, right? All of these that are in the chat and, and spoken are correct. And what is it that we say, hey, that's a synonym? It's not exactly the same emotion, but it's close enough that we associate these words with happiness. It's a similar emotional experience. So that's similarity. Contrast, we are always looking for which one does not belong, right? So the concept of pairing things together for similarity, we also look for uh, opposites. So if something is, um, If something is um, one side, it comes to opposite. So let's say hot versus cold. Happy versus? Sad. Most people say sad, but that's a trap question. Happy versus unhappy, <laughs> right? So it's, it's, it's a spectrum, but you can see how we contrast them. And then sad, sadness might be a more... Um, extreme version of that emotion. Uh, and then frequency, repeated exposure uh, to content helps us remember content. So these idea, the law of association, it's built into learning and memory. Contiguity, if we think of classical conditioning and operant conditioning, which are behaviorist points of view for how we learn to associate things, it's based on contiguity. If we were to think of the concept of rehearsal and of memory, when we're studying, repeating something over and over and over, well, Ebbinghaus said that rehearsal results in greater retention or memory. So that's frequency. And we could go on and on and on. Uh, Kahneman would talk about heuristics for similarity and contrast. But these ideas, that we're talking about in psychology are not new. When you think about it, we're talking 2,500 years ago, uh, we're, we're mentioning this. And I like to mention other like religious and spiritual traditions because your book unfortunately takes a Eurocentric point of view. And there are many faiths that um, predate Greek philosophy and the ideas were embedded in other religions or traditions that are even earlier than Aristotle. But unfortunately, we don't hear enough about these ideas uh, outside of, uh, you know, a multicultural classroom. So that's the law of association. Now, the Greek empire was destroyed by the Romans, right? So the Romans became the new empire and they really, 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 they took over and all of these academies where people would sit and think and discuss theoretical ideas, right? So they would sit as philosophers, they destroyed them. They didn't give people the time to sit and think as much and instead life became very very practical how am I going to feed my family 
uh, outside of, you know, being a philosopher. So people started to uh, shift from the deep introspective thought to more or less, how can we make the best life for ourselves? And there are different approaches. So these are the common approaches that are discussed uh, as to how people dealt with uh, the Romans destroying the Greek empire. Well, there were skeptics and cynics and most people try and use skepticism and cynicism uh, as synonyms, but they're not. Skepticism is where we suspend belief or we uh, cast doubt in something. But that doubt is not an absolute doubt. It's kind of like, well, I don't know. I need to think about it. Maybe these kind of tentative ideas where cynicism, cynicism is kind of a more negative mindset where you're rejecting of. So um, I guess from a a point of view, the agnostic would probably fit in the in the skeptic camp, and the atheist would fit in a cynic camp if we're talking about existence of a god, right? And then there were uh, people who said to try and avoid extreme pleasure because it's followed by pain. That's Epicureanism. We see that in, in some Buddhist traditions as well. And then we have uh, Stoics, which is kind of like radical acceptance of whatever is happening. Everything happens for a reason and we just got to deal with it, right? As is. And these are different mindsets. These were different ways that uh, people coped. Now, in Rome, the Roman Empire was pretty powerful even before the time of Jesus, right? So, um, and Christianity or early Christianity tried to, you know, move the faith away from the Roman God's model. So, uh, from this point of view, eventually Jesus comes on the scene and he um, is said to have been divinely inspired with knowledge and served as a guide for humanity. Uh, and he had a series of followers, right? So his disciples, and um, one of which was Paul. Now, uh, Jesus, according to tradition, never claimed he, uh, he was the Messiah, uh, whereas Paul was the first who truly claimed that Jesus was the Messiah and that he was the sacrificial lamb. Um, and you might see another one of his disciples, John, right? John 3.16. And one of the things that Paul and John do, which actually from a philosophy point of view, kind of eliminates this space for questioning, was creating a purely faith-based model. Who's going to get salvation? those who believe in Jesus, those who accept it. And you have to have complete acceptance in Jesus for that salvation. And so you might say, well, what's wrong with faith? There's nothing wrong with faith. But faith begins where human reasoning ends. And if you cannot ask questions, that's going to stifle, you know, philosophical curiosity. Ultimately, if we go even further forward in about the year 300, we have Constantine who comes about and is troubled that at 300 years after Jesus, there are all these different forms of Christianity. There are all these different um, books that were uh, considered holy books 
And there was a debate as to which books should be considered holy and, and divine in origin and which should be uh, not part of that tradition. So uh, Constantine was the person who took all the books and co uh, codified or codified the New Testament, right? So, uh, and the goal was to have a, you know, an agreed upon text. Now, if you study uh, Orthodox Christians versus uh, Roman Catholicism, uh, you start to see that there are different holy texts that the Orthodox Christian groups tend to adopt that are not part of Constantine's list. So it's, it's interesting, right? How, how the development of the faith began, but what did it do to Europe? Because Christianity spread very quickly through Europe, but uh, that faith model stopped questioning. And you might've heard the concept of the dark ages. The Dark Ages were where the, you know, questioning, the skepticism, the, the non-faith-based models were not allowed to coexist. Now, we talk about the Dark Ages, but I will tell you the Dark Ages occurred in Europe, but they did not occur in places like Northern Africa. There were many uh, Arabic scholars that continue to develop philosophical ideas while Christianity was still in Europe was still in these dark ages. There were Jewish scholars that continued to, to develop. So it, it was the it was the no questions asked model that kind of stagnated, you know, the development of philosophy in Europe. So um, the scholastic movement tries to correct for this. So you might hear people like Thomas Aquinas, right? Albertus Magnus, right? And, and these were people who said, wait a minute, I think we've gone too far in asking people to have pure blind faith. And uh, ultimately the scholastic movement was a movement to blend logic and reasoning with faith-based traditions. So St. Anselm talked about the idea that faith, it's okay to supplement faith with logic and reasoning, right? Uh, Peter Abelard uh, starts to link Aristotle to the Christian doctrines, right? Uh, Albertus Magnus started to adopt and study Jewish and Arabic commentaries to see how they could inform Christianity. And um, Thomas Aquinas, which was probably the most famous of all of the scholastics said, you know, once we put Aristotle in, it shouldn't be removed, right? So the, the Greek philosophy of Aristotle. So it's interesting that uh, religion and philosophy they, they, they're, they're intertwined. And I, I think that's what Thomas Aquinas was trying to say is that the ideas that uh, Aristotle were talking about could be found in the Bible and uh, we can blend them. Uh, so, but even the scholastic movement uh, had problems. Uh, there are some points where science and religion seem incompatible. And the scholastic movement tried to fit things like science and philosophy into the faith, but it didn't do a, a reasonably good job. And because it didn't do such a good job, neither science or philosophy advanced. And we started to see inconsistencies between um, philosophy and religion. We started to see inconsistencies between uh, science and religion. And um, then we have Occam. You might have heard of Occam's razor or the law of parsimony or Morgan's canon. These are 
all synonyms. Uh, and they say that the truth is usually found in the path that has the fewest number of assumptions. So the, the idea that have the fewest assumptions are more often than not the correct ones. Because every time you add an assumption, you run the risk of making a mistake. And uh, Occam suggested that, hey, wait a minute, we're piling on too many assumptions with the church dogma. And we, the scholastic movement could not fully accomplish its goal. So now let's shift to uh, 16 to 1800s. So it, it's, I want you to be mindful. I've literally moved you through about 2000 years uh, of history in less than an hour, <laughs> right? So there's a lot more to say, and I'm just giving you the highlights, of course. But um, let's talk about the spirit of mechanism. So the spirit of mechanism was pretty uh, prominent in the 16 to 1800s. And what is mechanism? If I'm going to define it, it's that every natural process can be explained. Uh, through physics and chemistry, uh, and they're mechanically determined, right? So you might see, how many of you have seen the clocks where when uh, they hit a certain hour, and these were big in Europe, they might dance or the uh, birds would come out and, and tweet or things like that. Uh, if you have seen that, that's part of the mechanistic spirit. So um, there is a word which I know I'm going to talk about called automata. Automata were machines or that performed human-like activities through either hydraulics or pulleys or things like that. And it was really a, a cool thing. And the wealthy would buy these mechanical figures because you might see one playing the violin. It's a, it is a doll, a figurine playing the violin. At that time, that was pretty marvelous. It was pretty remarkable for them to see. But if we were to look at how the doll did that, it was uh, mechanically driven, right? right? whether it be pipes with uh, water hydraulics, whether it be levers or pulley system, uh, they were able to get machines to, to do uh, these kind of uh, human-like performances. Now, we also start to see uh, the application of pulleys, levers, and cranes uh, how many of you have heard uh, the cuckoo clock? That's right, Rosa Maria. Uh, if you've heard of Leonardo uh, da Vinci, Leonardo da Vinci was an Italian scholar who developed many pulleys and crane systems to, to, to build and to sculpt and is considered one of the geniuses of his time. But the the point that I'm trying to bring up is that, hey, you know, everything is a machine. Everything has this structural system that it can be built on. And if we can get dolls to play the violin, if we can get pulleys and levels to uh, put a dome on a chapel, then certainly maybe the universe is just one large machine. Now we may not understand all of the elements of the universe, but it's uh, mechanically driven. And physicists have debated the origin of the universe uh, for quite some time. And I, I should actually say physicists have debated whether we have a universe versus a multiverse, right? <laughs> That's one debate. And then if we assume that we have a universe, 
there's a debate as to the origin of the universe and they do try and apply mechanistic assumptions to try and explain the origin of the universe. Now, machines uh, became pretty widespread. Um, and uh, I know Rosa Maria mentioned the cuckoo clock, right? Clock, the clock was a machine that was found pretty much in most people's houses, regardless of whether you were an aristocrat or not. Didn't matter, you had a clock. And if you took a clock apart, you would see a bunch of gears and gizmos, and you would see how they were intertwined. So trying, it was easy to understand the mechanistic spirit because if this clock has these gears and gizmos and everything just perfectly fits together, then maybe the universe is the same way. Now, moving forward to people like Galileo and Isaac Newton. So uh, we started to talk about matter, right? So Galileo talked about matter and motion and how atoms interact with one another. Uh, and that, that's pretty big because even when we think of states of matter, water, ice, and gas, Galileo was onto something, wasn't he, right? He was, he was very clear-minded before we could actually uh, be able to identify those atoms the way they are. Now, he also uh, broke free from the, the concept of the seven celestial bodies, the, the belief that the solar system had seven planets uh he rejected that notion uh and he was able to substantiate that that wasn't true now does anyone know how many planets we have in our solar system how many planets do you think we have so sanam says 12 laura says eight Teresa says eight with a question mark the reason why I ask the question is we have pretty much come to a point where we say eight. It used to be that we believed it nine, uh, but Pluto's status as a planet has come into question. RIP, way to go. Um, Laura, good, good job. But that's our solar system. Are there other planets or celestial bodies that are uh, rotating around other suns and other solar systems? The answer is yes, of course. So uh, Galileo also pushed against that. Now, Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton, you're probably familiar with the um, three basic laws of physics. Does anyone know the three basic laws of physics? Anyone know the three basic laws of physics? physics let's see objects in motion will stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force good job chloe the the converse is also true uh objects uh that are not in motion will remain not in motion until acted upon by an outside force. Uh, the law of conservation that energy is neither created nor destroyed. And gravity, gravity. I see someone said matter, but it's it, gravity, right? Will take effect. And these basic principles are Newtonian physics. So, uh, you know, it's interesting because we could apply that to the universe how the one of the more widely endorsed statements of how the uni universe occurred was the big bang theory so this is fairly uh common but we don't we don't have a good understanding to date as to why the big bang even occurred right if newton 
is correct that things in rest stay in rest unless acted upon by an outside force. What's the outside force? And there are some people who say the outside force is God. God used the Big Bang in order to roll out the universe. And other people say it might have been um, a rogue comet, things like that. There are other explanations that are out there. But so understanding how forces either attract or repel atoms, that also comes from uh, Sir Isaac Newton. All right. Are you still on my screen? Because it kind of glitched on me. We still see. Okay, perfect. So again, we're still talking about a mechanistic spirit, right? So machines. So everything has a, a easily understood structure. The gears go together pretty logically. So when we talk about uh, the universe, well, everything is lawful. Everything is orderly. Everything is predictable. And uh, Newton uh, famously uh, said, the universe is a clock, which was the model of mechanism of the day. And God is the mathematician, the orchestrator of the clock. So it, you start to see how physics and theology are somewhat connected. They become further and further apart as time goes, but you see, start to see um, mechanistic explanations, <laughs> excuse me, mechanistic observations or explanations of the universe. Now, what was said that is most powerful as we're moving away from a speculative um, field or discipline to a scientific discipline were the features that we just listed, uh, careful observation, experimentation, and systematic measurement, right? So we should be able to observe, measure, and experiment with anything in nature. So um, we should be able to apply these three principles to try and understand uh, how the world operates and be able to predict a future occurrence as well. All right, so like I said, the clock uh, was the metaphor for mechanism. I'm, I'm hammering this home, which probably tells you that it might be on a test. So keep track of what I'm saying, right? So the, the clock, like I said, one of the reasons why it was the metaphor for mechanism uh, was that it, all levels of society had a clock at this point. Now, some had the more fancy clock, some had a basic clock, but a clock operated the same way. It was, you know, with a bunch of gears that were interlocking and moved the hands of the clock. And because of the design of the gears, they were able to create a timepiece that was predictable, precise, and, and fairly regular. You know, it didn't lose, I shouldn't say it didn't lose time. Sometimes clocks do become a little slow, but if wound properly and designed properly, they should be regular, predictable, and and precise. And that's the concept of the universe as well. Now, so if we were to uh, think about uh, the clock as a model, we have various quotes that show, like I said, this clock model for the universe. So Robert Boyle, Johanna Kepler, Rene Descartes, you know, you might hear these quotes attributed to them as the harmony and the order of the universe were analogous to the reliability and regularity of the clock. So the natural world has a reliable and predictable way of working. And I'll give you an example. So if earth is rotating around the sun and, and we have 
uh, a moon rotating um, around the Earth, well, these two uh, other bodies will help us understand what is a day, and it'll help us understand what is a year, right? Now, um, in all fairness, there is a debate between a lunar year and a solar year, and a, there's about 11 days difference, roughly, between the two. Uh, but it doesn't matter. But either way, we can tell time, we can understand what a day is, we can understand what a year is, and so forth. It's predictable, the universe, the same way the gears of a clock are reliable. Uh, Christian von Wolf said the universe was, behaves no different than clockwork, right? You might hear the phrase like clockwork, like clockwork means it's predictable and dependable. And then uh, von Wolf's student said, uh, it is in the clock on a small scale that helps our understanding of the universe on the large scale. So I don't care which quote you take, you're starting to see over and over and over that the clock is the metaphor for the universe due to its reliability, dependability, predictability, consistency, however you wanna say. Now let's talk about uh, determinism. So we talked about mechanism as a philosophical point of view. Let's talk about determinism. Right, so a deterministic concept was that um, there's no free will, right? So the philosophers would say, well, God put the universe in motion in a way that it could operate without any further interference. What do I mean by that? Um, it's predictable, it's orderly. So the natural world is predictable, right? Similar to waves, that cycle, we can predict it, we understand it. And we don't need God's uh, interference for things to happen now. But uh, determinism, it just means everything's preordained. So if uh, from this point of view, God set the world in motion with a set of rules, those rules are not violated. So everything, if we know uh, a stimulus, we know an environmental trigger, we can predict an outcome. So it should be interesting to note that people like B.F. Skinner were uh, behavioral determinists. They were uh, determinists because they didn't believe in free will. Even people like Sigmund Freud was a determinist. Now, he wasn't uh, based on the, the physical or environmental. He, he had more of what's called a psychical determinism. So the unconscious was predictively pushing our behavior. But either way, determinism says everything is orderly. Everything is consistent. There's no deviations from whatever the structure is in place. Now, we have different forms of determinism. We have biological determinism. So uh, physiological or genetic predispositions can cause behavior or impact behavior. And that's pretty, pretty accurate. We were able to connect genetics to behavior. Uh, and if you're interested in the more complex explanation of biological determinism, I would recommend looking at something like uh, the epigenetic research. We also have the environmental determinism, environmental stimuli cause behavior. This is kind of where our radical behaviorists took the position. And then we have sociocultural determinism uh, that there are explicit and implicit rules in society that uh, we are forced to operate within and deviations from those social or cultural rules are not welcomed. So 
we also talk about physical and psychical determinism as a, another way of thinking about this. Physical uh, uh, determinism is that we can study behavior, directly observable behavior. That's physical determinism. Whereas psychical determinism, we're looking at your thoughts and emotions as uh, predictors of behavior. Now, the problem with determinism is that it doesn't 100% explain behavior. If you had a genetic predisposition for something, it doesn't mean that you're guaranteed to exhibit that trait or behavior. So biological determinism falls away. Things like having um, an environmental trigger. People don't respond to the same environmental trigger the same way. And I could go through all of these and show how uh, it, the concept of determinism is an incomplete understanding of uh, human behavior. Oh, now there's um, other schools of thought. There's indeterminism and non-determinism. Indeterminism adopts to some degree the concept of determinism. And it says that, yeah, all behavior is determined, but the determining factors are not always known, right? So yeah, everything, all behavior is motivated. We may not know what the motivation is. We may not understand uh, the driving force. And built in this concept of indeterminism is when we try and put a spotlight on it, it changes behavior in of itself. So uh, people behave differently when they're being observed than when they're not being observed. Or I'll say differently, people behave differently when they know they're being observed versus when they don't know they're being observed. So I'll give you an example. If you were to uh, be in class right now, physical class, and all 35 of us were together roughly, uh, and you had to pass gas, would you pass gas in the classroom without excusing yourself? The answer is most people would leave the room. They, they wouldn't do that because they would worry about what other people thought of them, whereas everybody in their home passes gas, and they likely don't excuse themselves from a room, most people, that is. So merely having other people observing your behavior might actually change the behavior. And then you have the concept of non-determinism. Non-determinism was the argument that behavior is not preordained. Behavior is not caused by some kind of pre-established physical or unconscious environmental factor. Rather, we have free will. We have the ability to choose and impact our experience. And the non-deterministic point of view was adopted by people like Abraham Maslow, people like uh, Carl Rogers, many of the humanistic and existential points of view. They rejected the concept of determinism because it limits the concept of personal growth. And if we're saying that, um, if we're saying that um, people can reach their potential, such as self-actualization, right? Or a fully functioning person, as Rogers would say, how can you reach your potential? How can you grow? if no matter what your behavior was preordained, that's, that doesn't work, right? So, so the um, humanistic existential psychologist adopted more of a non-deterministic view. Now, so we talked about mechanism, we talked about determinism, and now let's talk about reductionism. Reductionism is trying to 
break things down into their smallest parts, their basic parts, right? So everything can be uh, diced finer and finer until we get to the most elementary part, right? So uh, if we go back to the clock example, well, we can reduce the clock as a whole to its components, such as the gears and, and the springs uh, in order to understand how it functions, right? So breaking it down to its part. If we wanted to understand water from a um, molecular point of view, we would understand that it's H2O, right? Two hydrogen molecules, one oxygen molecule. So this would be a reductionist mindset, right? So we're trying to break things down smaller and smaller and smaller in order to better understand it. Now, the reductionist mindset we see in the work of Wundt and Titchener, which we'll talk about in lectures four and five, but we also start to see um, this in neuroscience as well. So if we were to say, well, um, what causes depression? Now, obviously there are several dozen answers, but if, if you answered the question by saying, depression is caused by low levels of serotonin, well, you're trying to explain the experience of depression based on a, a molecule, a, a chemical. And that would be a very reductionist point of view. And um, I will tell you that today uh, in um, psychotherapy, we don't just take a reductionist point of view. We take biological, psychological, social factors, and even spiritual factors at play to determine uh, predispositions for mental illness. But reductionism is part of everything. Uh, it's part of every science, whether it be mathematics, when they say reduces fraction, whether it be uh, chemistry, when you go to the periodic table of elements, or whether it be physics, uh, where I'll do uh, more of like, uh, and applied physics, such as building a, uh, a roller coaster. Uh, the roller coaster as a whole is broken up by a series of angles and, and whatnot. So every, every science has some um, reductionism in it. So, and psychology is no different. So I mentioned to you about these automata, which were these mechanical structures that could do all kinds of cool things. And believe it or not, um, these are older than we're giving credit. So if you go to ancient Greece or um, uh, Far East Asia or, or part of the Arab world, these mechanical structures uh, were pretty commonplace. But because the clock became such a cool gadget, we even put these automata into clocks as well. And if you go to many train stations in Europe, such, such as Germany, Austria, the Netherlands, you can see a whole bunch of clocks with these automata. And um, if we were to apply this model of the, the mechanical model to human beings, we would basically say that the body's a machine that was created by God, right? So in all of our organs, all of our, our muscles, everything is part of this structure that was created by God. Now, you're hearing a lot more about the philosophy of God than you hear in most psychology textbooks, but that's because this is the philosophy part of the course, and I do apologize if, uh, if you're an atheist or agnostic, I apologize for how much you're hearing about God, but this is uh, the philosophy mindset. Now, so um, we start to, like I said, the automata become pretty pervasive in the general uh, population, even in books and gardens and uh, clock towers. I said it, it's 
um, pretty, pretty cool and pretty commonplace to the point where many scientists thought that they might be able to create an artificial person, right? The same way we build um, machines. Now, it's interesting. Do you think the philosophers and scientists were correct? that we might be able to create an artificial person? Sarah says, no. Uh, Jenny says, yes. All right. Um, and uh, Victoria says, not 100%. So I'm gonna go with the first three of you. Jenny, explain why you say yes. Um. I feel like, you know, you can't really predict a future because, you know, who knows in a way. And then like, cause like, you know, technology these days has been a bit crazy. So because like there is like virtual reality and robots. So we never know what will become of technology in the future. So I'm just like, do so it as a possibility. You're inspired by things like virtual reality. And I'm going to add the concept of artificial intelligence, right? Because that's also, I guess, the other angle for your argument. Sarah, you say no. Why do you say no? Well, I changed my mind and I said, they probably will, but never 100% human. Well, certainly not human if it's a- Artificial, yeah. Yeah, artificial person, uh, it won't, we wouldn't call it a human, it, we would call it artificial person. Um, uh, Teresa says robots, and then Victoria, you said not 100%. Tell me your logic. Um, I just feel like if they were ever to create something that's close to exactly what a human is, I'm saying it won't be 100% because it would kind of just be coding, it would just be a system that would perform ways that wouldn't have the complexity of like processing emotions to the fullest extent, if that makes sense. It would just kind of replicate and mimic. Now, what I like about our discussion is because this is actually the argument that people had and there's something called the Turing test, T-U-R-I-N-G. And Turing was a scientist who basically figured out algorithms. He was responsible during World War II, helping break the code so that we could intercept German messages and whatnot. So he created machines that had algorithms that could think. But he, what he argued is that we never had a machine that could fully pass the Turing test and be 100% independent and spontaneous the way human beings are. And that goes back to the argument of coding. And, and, and Turing was, he did a good job in his argument, except more recently, AI, there have been more and more um, artificial intelligences that have passed the uh, Turing tests. And I think there was, um, there was, a computer that played chess that was, you know, spontaneous and, um, you know, like a human being would be. Uh, and IBM Watson is another example. We're getting pretty darn close. Now, I did see that um, the soul, like Jocelyn Ray's is like, hey, you know, there are certain things about emotions, whether it be if you don't believe in the soul, but emotions, um, artificial beings may not be able to express emotions the way we do, uh, as well as if you believe in a soul, it's not going to have that. So the jury is still out, but we have had several computers pass the Turing test, which was the scientific measure of artificial intelligence behaving human-like. So, which is, you know, it's pretty cool because there is a time in my lectures, and I wonder if I, I cleared it out, but 
where I said, and no computer has ever passed the Turing test. And now there have been. So AI has gotten really good. And if you're looking for investment opportunities or things like that, that's probably where you want to put your money. Uh, and I'm not a, I'm not a trader. This is just my, you know, my personal opinion. So if you think that, you know, I'm, I'm plugging AI and telling you where to put your money a hundred percent, don't listen to me, but, but yeah, so philosophers and scientists believe that they might be able to create an artificial person and we're getting closer and closer. We'll see where it goes. Now, here are examples, right? And um, on the left, you had a, uh, a doll that could serve tea, bend over, serve tea. And then on the right, you had a monk that could rotate his head back and forth. These are just some examples of automata machines that were doing human-like properties. We even had um, a doll that could write a letter. And that's right, a mechanical duck that can poop, right? <laughs> Whoever picked that one, you know, whatever. But the, the concept, notice how they're modeling these machines after humans and other animals saying, hey, well, maybe that's how human beings are built or constructed. So not only is the universe uh, operating from a mechanistic point of view, but so are human beings, so are animals, right? And these schematics and pictures tell that story. Now, Julian Dilimitri. Julian Dilimitri was uh, quite an influential individual. And he basically suggests that at one time, artificial intelligence could get to a point that machines were just as enlightened as human beings. And it was very possible that machines could take over the world, right? <laughs> that was his assumption, right? And, and when he wrote Man and Machine, he kind of created the argument that we're just enlightened machines ourselves. And um, he really believed that at one point or another, machines would take over. And let's see, they can definitely take our jobs in the future. That is true. They have already started to do so. Every time, I, and Rosa Marie, I'm going to come to you as well, but every time you go to a self-checkout line, that is a job that once was human. Every time you go and use your easy pass, that was a job that was once human. Every time you go to the ATM, that was a job that was once human. So your point about machines starting to take our jobs, Chloe, uh, you're spot on. Now, um, Rosa Marie, you had your hand up as well. Yeah, I was going to say what you said and that um, whatever this um, man said, it is, it is true, like washing machines, vacuums, blenders, mm -hmm. stoves, all major household appliances, phones, they're taking away everything from us. Before we used to write letters or we used to talk. Now people use cell phones as a way to disengage from other humans or to cope with their problems. Uh, people used to wash their clothes by hand. Now they just put it in a machine and push a button and it washes and dries your clothes. Before we'd wash them by hand and dry them on a clothing line outside, we would sweep our houses. Now we have a vacuum. Now there are vacuums that just do it for you. Just push a button. You could be at work if you have the iRobot vacuum and it'll vacuum and mop your old house from a totally different location. Ring cameras, like the this goes on and on forever. Right, right on. And, and that, I mean, look. It also it, makes you think of the, one of my um, psych professors, we had like a segment about the Wally movie 
and all the people that they were on another planet and they became fat and lazy. And it was like talking about Americans basically, because they say that Americans are very lazy, that we have a lot of technology and technology does everything for us. And we're trying to make it our lives as easier as possible. And that's the same thing with like Zoom meetings too. People don't want to go to in-person lectures anymore. So they have Zoom, the convenience of their yeah. home. They could just sit in bed and do a lecture or uh, lay down or watch TV and just have the professor talk. Yeah. And I appreciate the last, and I'm, I'm sensitive to the last point, Rosemary, because I love teaching. I love it. And some of you have had me before and you've had me in the classroom and I'm animated and I'm walking around the class and whatnot. And now I feel like I'm just a, a floating bubble, like the Brady Bunch, right? And one of those little squares, uh, just talking head or whatever you want to say it. And it has changed. It has changed how I conceptualize my lectures and how I convey the material. And there are some advantages that I'm able to memorialize what I say and give you a resource if you have to miss a class. That's wonderful, but it also does affect the process of learning. Um, most people do not have their camera on. And I remember in one semester, I put it in my syllabus that everybody had to have their camera on. And nobody did anyway. And you can't force just because I put in my syllabus I, because I want to connect with you. It doesn't mean that people are going to do it. Right. Um, so I, I stopped fighting that fight. So but I know when the, when the uh, cameras are off, I have no control whether you're actually even listening to me. And I know you are, Rosemary, because you're participating. But does that mean everybody who's here is actually taking notes while I'm lecturing and whatnot? I don't know. In a classroom, I do. So yes, there is something lost by yielding uh, that which we used to do as people and in person. Letting machines take over uh, comes with a cost. I 100% agree. Now, uh, this idea of man being a machine you know, it, it's wrapped into a lot of uh, the books and even uh, things like The Wizard of Oz. Pay no attention, be, uh, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, right? Oz was just, you know, a person, you know, using like mechanical, um, mechanical animations to imply that he was all powerful when he wasn't, right? Um, the Tin Man, right? All of these things, we put it together and the, the mechanistic spirit of human beings was really, really there. Now, Charles Babbage. Charles Babbage loved clocks, should not shock you. Uh, he was a British mathematician and, um, you know, he developed the first calculating machine. This is your rudimentary calculator, right? So we all have calculators on our phone, but it was a, a tabulating machine. Now, it's important to understand this is not the first uh, counting apparatus, right? Because we had the abacus and things like that. But in terms of a calculator, he had um, him and his student at a Lovelace had the tabulating machine. Now, um, went to Cambridge University. Cambridge University is one of the Ivy League schools in England and became very frustrated and bored with education because oftentimes he knew more than his professor. And, you know, I, I'm starting my 18th year of teaching and I have to tell you, that I have experienced on at least two occasions where I had a student that was absolutely a genius, genius, and they got it right away. And I was like, they probably know more conceptually than I do. And it's a, it, you know, 
knowing that I tried to do more enriching activities and try and draw them in because you could lose interest if you feel like you know more than your professor. Uh, but it, it is, I, I understand Babbage uh, and it isn't always the case, right? Where people are like, um, you know, the professor is the gospel. The professor is the sage. There are sometimes when you're dealing with a genius and Babbage was a genius that it's possible that you're running circles around the people teaching you. Now, my advice, if you're one of those people, you have to get through it. You have to get through it until you're at the point where you're sharing your knowledge and you're delivering your ideas. Um, and even if you're less interested because of that, don't let that interfere with your career because there are a lot of there are a lot of homeless geniuses. I hate to say it that way, but there are people who just lost interest because they didn't connect to uh, the world around them because nobody got them or what it, or they were bored with what other people had to say. Um, so Babbage was one of these people who went to the elite of the elite and you know, really was frustrated in his education. Now, I talked to you about a tabulating machine. It's a primitive calculator. Now, what's interesting about this, if you look at this, this looks, it's a machine, it's mechanistic. This was a massive, massive structure. And when we think of our calculators, the, this cell phone has a calculator uh, and it operates with more processing power than that machine that might fill up um, a big corner of a room, right? So, but if you had to do things by hand or use one of these uh, tabulating machines, you would definitely want to have uh, this kind of uh, tabulating machine. And other things that did have some algorithms that it could do basic math, play chess, checkers, things like that. And what Babbage and Ada Lovelace were able to do with this is to demonstrate that uh, the cognitive process that we use for mathematics and things like that, the mental processes, we could duplicate using machines. And that was pretty powerful. Now, uh, the uh, Babbage tabulating machine became larger and larger. It became an uh, analytical engine. If you look at all these um, wheels and levers for counting is massive, right? You might hear the punch card system. Um, you are familiar with SPSS, but there was a time when people had to do their research by hand. And when the punch card machine came out where you plug it in and it calculated like this machine, People loved it because it saved them a lot of time. Now, I think about technology and I think about this really remarkable analytical engine. And um, I'm like, wow, you know, we take a lot for granted because people did things by hand. And then they had these massive uh, structures that were the size of rooms, like the computers. Uh, and we just have these we have things at our fingertips that we take for granted. But anyway, this was the first attempt to truly get some kind of human-like process in a machine. Um, now this engine ultimately winds up you know, stalling because the British government was funding it and they pulled their funding. Now, Ada Lovelace, the reason why I, uh, I like to talk about her is because in history, you know, more often than not, the, the great women thinkers in history are ignored, right? So Ada Lovelace was absolutely brilliant. And she was able, as a math prodigy, she was able to take uh, Babbage's work and make it more meaningful and find practical uses for it and even have a critical analysis of it. So um, her contribution 
to things like artificial intelligence and cognitive psychology uh, is probably underappreciated, right? So um, the concept of AI probably comes from her and Charles Babbage to some degree. The concept of the um, computer model of the mind, right? A neural network and encoding storage and retrieval for memory. These all come out of the work of Babbage and Lovelace. So really, I, I want us to take a moment and, and appreciate these great minds. Now, this is a perfect place to press pause. Um, I'm gonna stop today's lesson here, and then we'll start to say the beginnings of modern science uh, and go through people like uh, Descartes and whatnot. So I'm gonna stop my share. I'm gonna stop my recording and I'm gonna take attendance one more time.